Recently left teaching after 20 years and then a consultant supporter or whatever at the moment. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I entered teaching in 94 and it was all pretty much led by local authorities. And now it seems like another form of local authorities, which is the academy trusts. Um, and I'm just wondering, 10 or 15 years down the line, I mean, there's this massive push towards academies, this drive uh, uh, for somebody who's not studied to a very high academic level, just a practitioner in the classroom, I can't, I've never believed that there was any kind of advantage to academies other than people's political ambitions. Um, where, where do you see it going? Is, is there going to be a revolution in another 15, 20 years? Are going to go back to local authority control? What, what, uh, can I just tell a story which I've used a couple of times in the past? We went to dinner in 2004, which was... Um, it was a panel at the RSA at which Ted Ragg was speaking. It was just before Ted Ragg died, wasn't it? And there was a dinner afterwards, and I sat next to Michael Wilshaw. We got into an argument about academies and local authorities and things, and he was going on about how terrible local authorities were based on his experience at one school, as far as I can make out, in Newham. Um, but at the end of it, he said, to me, the thing is, in the end, they're going to have to reinvent local authorities. And actually, we're getting back to that point now. And it, it, I don't think it will be the academy chase. I think if you look at what's happened to the legislation going through Parliament at the moment, the Academy is an adoption, uh, education and adoption bill, the power is going to be located in the hands of these regional school commissioners who are now being set up as a new middle tier, but they're appointed by government and they will work directly to the Secretary of State rather than to local people. And the only way it's going to work longer term if this mass academisation takes place is to expand their role, give them more staff, and effectively create sort of regional and sub-regional levels of administration which would broadly do the same things that the local authorities did. And I think probably that will be the key to it rather than the academy chains because the academy chains are very, very patchy. And, you know, you've got some areas you haven't got chains, you've got, just got standalone academies. But look to the regional school commissioners as the place where the power will lie in the future, I think. But there'll be very <coughs> different local authorities oh, yeah. because they'll just be chiefs. They'll, they'll be like regional chiefs. Yeah, but they'll have, have to start. do many of the things that local authorities have done in the past. So really, we should really have tried to make the local authority model work better rather than trying to invent something new. Well, we'll come full circle eventually. As, as there's been this advance towards academisation of schools, there seems to be a significant weakening of the power of trades unions yeah. at, at such some, some academies of such a accepted and taken on some of those trade, trade unions, others that, that we ignore them all. Do you think that the trade union movement will, will, will um, research again in the future or do you, do you think it's going to be a thing in the past? I don't think so because I think people will always need to be represented by unions and fundamentally they, their, their core job is to represent their members' interests and make sure they've got employment protection and so on. I think, to, I think to that extent, that, and even in academies, they recognize, they most of them do recognize the unions because they know it's the best way to manage staff relations. Whether the unions will have a powerful voice in the public debate is, is questionable. I mean, I wrote this piece about teacher education today, teacher shortages, but you know, that was prompted by a, a call by the head teacher unions, who are not considered to be particularly radical and you know, represent all the school leaders, saying that there was a crisis emerging to which the DfE's response is, you're just scaremongering. Now, you know, if the head teachers' unions can't make their case to the government and be heard, it's obviously a concern. Their influence in that sense, I think, it is limited, but I think they'll continue to do a job for their members, so people will join unions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all I would add on that is one feature of the last few years, and again, something that started with Thatcherism and New Labour, but really intensified, is the marginalisation of the unions. In, you know, they're not called in to they're not consulted with in a way that they would have been before. Personally, Fiona and I might have different views. I think they've responded quite well in that they have adapted and try and represent their members' interests. And also unions increasingly have done, my impression is, more and more policy work to try and have an impact given that they're totally marginalised by government. I mean, it's, it's part of a broader problem. I remember being really shocked to read an interview with Len McCluskey in which he said he had never once, you know, head of one of the biggest trade unions, he would never been called in or met a single government minister in his, you know, in the five years of the coalition. I just thought that was incredible. And of course, there was a period where, you know, some people said there was 
too close relations between them. But the, the, teacher trade, the teacher unions of various kinds, from the NUT through to NASUW, right, right up to the teacher, head teacher unions, are quite active. Mm. I mean, they do, they do a lot and produce a lot. Can I just introduce Henry Stewart? Yeah, so that's why he's sitting here. Sorry, mate. Okay, let's take the lady here at the back there. And this lady here the, yeah. Oh, I'm just starting on. So could you say who you are before I'm, you? My yeah. name's Jill Austin. I'm a recently retired teacher. Uh, and I'm a member of committee member of my local NUT branch. Um, how I would say that one of the reasons, as it seems from a teacher's point of view, that the, one of the reasons academies were set up was in order to take teachers out of their paying conditions. And therefore, uh, unions are pretty much hand-tied when they're trying to deal with, with um, conditions for their teachers within, uni within academies. Uh, that they haven't got the basis of the burgundy book to, to work to because it doesn't apply anymore. And, uh, and, and very often the union reps in schools are targeted as being, uh, well, the ones who might perhaps need to have capability and so on and so forth. But, uh, that's my just view of my observations. <coughs> Your point now, so I'm going to take both together from Sir Williams and the point. And um, my point is really to, um, perhaps I'm a little more sceptical about the rights view of companies. Sorry, so I can't hear you. Oh, sceptical about the rights. I'm a little more sceptical about the rights view of companies of education because I think part of the Academy Act is bringing the, the standard learning academies, which we've all known, and perhaps then benign tr uh, trusts. And we've also got the chains, which are the corporate chains, yeah. as similar to the charters in America that you mentioned. Now, what the charters deliver in America is that draconian sort of education, and they're delivering it to black kids in America, the same as working class kids are getting here. Yeah. And, and it's a sort of, I don't know if anyone's watched any of the videos of the core knowledge, core curriculum yeah. sort of videos where children don't know whether they're coming or going. Primary school kids are made to chant all day, to answer, to do certain movements with their hands. Their bodies have to be in a certain way to learn. They have to track with their eyes. It's very intense. And, and um, I would say um, very um, <laughs> narrow, and it doesn't treat, uh, teach any sort of creativity, it doesn't give any space for that. So that is what um, the right here sees would be good for the working class yeah, in yeah. this country. Whereas the more middle class children are going to get the liberal standalone um, academy to attend, which won't be using any of those silent corridor techniques, which we have in this country already, mm. you know, no talking between classes and all this sort of stuff. So I think what they mean by comprehensive isn't something that you would like your child to go to. No, no, I, do, I, th I don't disagree with the word you say, I th I th I, and I try to. Just the question, please, because we did not. Okay, what? Well, it's Sarah, isn't it? Yeah. Sa what Sarah was saying is that the political rights view, that I said the political right accept non-selective education, Sarah was saying they have a very different and segregated view of it, that they would, it's control, controlling working class children in militarised type schools and then standalone academies for the more liberal middle class. I don't disagree with that, I th but I do... And, and I was trying to say, yes, they believe in non-selective education, but of a completely different kind. And I didn't maybe elaborate it enough. But they are anti-grammar. And I think that when you see, you know, when you look back over the history of this country, the grammars were a disaster for most children. And it's not that these alternatives are better, but to, to say to children at 11 that you are a failure, you know, is, is and, and now the right one, some of the right want to bring it back. It's, it's got to be a good thing that some of the Tory party have left that behind. It's maybe because their own kids can get into the grammar schools. So no, I think they genuinely believe it. I think they recognise that it, it squashes, um, well, they, they, they say it suppresses social mobility. Just one little point is that I think what primary school children go through now is in no way less bad than the 11 plus. They're all doing that in their SATS tests that they're practicing for two years to ten. So I think we've still got kids that are labelled as level four. So they might still go into the same school yeah. as their level six friends, but they won't be in the same classes when they get there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
I, just, I think we have to also recognise that one reason some people on the right don't like selection is because it interferes with the market. And they believe that the pure market model, if you just have a choice driven model, then you can't have any selection on the part of the supplier, as it were. And that's another reason. But I mean, there is a convergence of interest there that has, means that you can make some of the arguments about selection from, from a, you know, for different reasons, but from the same. Yeah, yeah sorry, yes. Look at that. I saw I see Gary Young give a, a lecture, and in Chicago, you know, Paris is striking against their local school and coming in charge. They feel so strong in hunger striking, sorry to say. They didn't beat. Really? Yeah. That, I mean, I was going to say that's great. That gives us the wrong impression. But I'm so glad that parents are They're rebelling. Feeling. Because parents here, on the whole, tend not really to be very militant about anything. Yeah, I think if we did get the, the full charter going on here, we'd, we would see that. Well, we might do that in this parliament, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the lady there in the back, John Yeah. Um, my question was just as... Um, can you, so can you say who you are? Yeah, Maggie, you? Um, I'm a PTP. Yeah. Um, it's kind of terrifying um, as a PGC student to be like, where do we go? There's very limited options. We're going to have to look for jobs. And um, also, where are I'm not a fine PGC student. I'm, you know, there's a lot of art and science PGC students. I'm going to have to look for jobs in these sort of schools. Um, and, you know, what, what do we, like, how do we do teach the way we want to? teach, I mean, yeah, it's... Maybe Francis <laughs> might be the right person to answer that. Did you hear that? No. Okay, so oh, this young, that young Maggie, lady yeah. is um, <coughs> training to be a teacher here, I presume. Yeah. Trained to be an art and design teacher, and she, what she was <coughs> saying is, what's it going to be like when I go out there in this environment? Oh, and now Francis... I'm just getting a chair, otherwise... Oh, right, okay. Can I just make a point about that? Because I think it's, it's going to be a sort of... Um, you know, you're going to be in a very powerful position because of the teacher shortages that are emerging. And remember, we've got 800,000 more people coming into the system. Otherwise, I'll be off camera, won't I? Oh, no, we've got to have you I on camera. I can't be off camera. <laughs> <laughs> all, my, all my PGC students are laughing now. <laughs> so we're going to have a lot more children. You are and Maggie. Not enough teachers. So people will be able to pick and choose which schools they go to. And actually, I think one thing that may change the ethos of some of these schools is they recognise they can't retain or attract and hold and start that people will be able to go to the schools that have a more positive culture and more positive working ethos. So I think, you know, trainee teachers, new teachers will be able to shop around to a certain extent, especially in London where there are more vacancies than any other part of them. to do the sort of teaching they want to do and should they go and work in free schools and academies and sort of... Well, and some of those schools may have a positive culture and be a, a, enabling. We don't know that. I think that, you know, I think we can't just dismiss them all as one type of school. They'll be very... Draconian regimes in some of the maintained schools as well. But I, my point is, I think that people will be able to shop around more to the sorts of environments they want to work in, and that can only be a good thing. So, of course, then teachers to recognise they're going to attract and retain staff that maybe they're going to have to think again. I don't know if Francis can have. Yeah, I would just like to echo that um, that uh, you, you are, as teachers now, in quite a strong position to sort of shop around for jobs because there is a real recruitment crisis going on. I would also like to say. I mean, and this is me changing my views yet again. Join your union and get heavily involved in your union because the unions have never been more important than now where, the, as someone said, the erosions of uh, um, working rights and the salary, I mean, there's been a 1% salary increase over the last five years, I mean, and I don't know how some teachers survive with families in London you know, the unions are really important and I was at the NUT conference last week and they really, really do genuinely care a, a, about helping young teachers. So, and, and the more collective voice you have, uh, the more powerfully you can lobby. Um, but they certainly are involved with, and I know in Tower Hamlets a number of cases of trying to get, you know, things a, a lot more um, suitable and they will also help you with things like the jobs fair because, you know, you're going to get a lot of offers out there I think and, and it's good to have someone you can go to to look at what sorts of contracts you're signing um, yeah I'm glad to hear you say that yeah I, I mean I, 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 I have because I think I, I mean as people who know me I've kind of shifted from being pretty right-wing in the late 90s <laughs> to um, just open it as Medina's 
uh, uh, just 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 the, the sheer experiences of going through the system and just seeing how teachers' rights. I mean, Davina will know this, and Pete will know this, won't you? That teachers' rights have been eroded so much in the last 20 years, and we do have a very difficult situation in schools at the moment. Many of us, you know, know about firsthand of, of huge amounts of stress on teachers, and that's why, you know, joining your union is the place where you can really get some genuine support um, is really important. Could I just, just say something else? Yeah. Um, I'm Dr. Davina Lloyd and I was Francis's head teacher at a, a very, very successful yeah. comprehensive in London, um, which was consistently the number one comprehensive in London in the standards reviews. Um, I was just saying to the young teachers here, it's very difficult, the environment you're going into now, but if you want to know whether the school is going to be one in which you would like to work, um, when you, before you hand in your CV, before you think about going, or maybe the same time as you do, ask if you can spend a day in the school. No good head teacher, desperate to get the best that's out there, will prevent you from coming in and spending time in the school. And ask questions. And at your interview or before your interview, ask the head teacher what their policy is on how you teach certain subjects. And if you don't like the head teacher's response and you know you're not going to be able to get on with them, then withdraw your application and go somewhere else. Um, but you, you gain a lot from just being in school. Since my retirement, I've worked um, with uh, various institutions on teacher training and have the privilege of visiting many schools across London and Essex, which are the areas I work in. And you find out a great deal within your first few minutes in the school, and even more by the end of the day, about whether or not you would want to work there. And as a head teacher, I, mean, I had a view, do I want this person to teach my child and my mother as well? And that was the view that I had. Um, and I think, uh, as Francis will know, is that when you've got good teachers, you want to hold on to them, and you always want to choose the very best. Yeah. My, my, my question was, um, and I was very interested, thank you, Melissa, for everything you said, what's Nikki Morgan's view yeah. on where we're going? Yeah. And, um, has she seen your book, and does she have a response? Oh, has, I, I can that. <laughs> I'm so aware of the lady yeah, so up there. Yes, that's the lady in the back of the And then I want to ask Kelly to say a few words. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm looking forward to listening to your answer. I just want to say I'm an NQT. Um, I've just graduated from Goldsmith. And I am working in a free school myself. And um, when I first applied for the job, what I was looking for was for the independence to be able to teach the way I wanted to teach, which was the way I was taught here. And I was so passionate about it that I was really scared about going into schools and not being able to teach what I thought worked, because having experienced being on placement in schools where I had that liberty, I was really scared of not being able to do that and not feel satisfied with my job. So I ended up going for the free school because I thought, well, you know, I'll have a go and see, maybe I'll get that freedom. And I have been very lucky and I've been very supported in that they respect what I do and they feel that my training at Golfers was very strong and I have been able to create, sort of create, well, I have created my own scheme of work and it, it's been brilliant. You know, I'm not saying at all, oh yeah, definitely go free school, but in, in my opinion, well, in my own experience, I've just been quite lucky that they have been supportive and the individuals that work within the free school are forward thinking and want the best, best for the children. And yes, there are certain things that I disagree with, like there is a bit of streaming that, you know, I don't particularly like. But overall, the individual people that work there are really pro-educating these children and giving them the best education they can be. So I feel like my experience has been really positive. Okay. I'm going to come back to the Nikki Morgan question, but I just want to ask Henry to say, I know you wanted to say a few words, but just to remind you that Melissa talked about Henry's research into the academy at effect some length, yes. at some length. So mm -hmm. you could say a little bit about that and also respond to any of the other points. And then we'll go back to what we think that you might do in the next five, four years. Okay, I did just want to, to respond to the question about should I work in a academy or free school? Because I think that is a, a you, you can want to answer to it. I mean, I think all of us are, are clear that if schools were still under, it would be better if schools were still under local authority, democratic oversight. Um, but with that, isn't the world we live in. 
we live in a world where close to two thirds of secondary is a junior or secondary teacher are academies. Um, and while, and I think the point is, go and look, like say, go and look at the school, because while some academies are very militarised and are no, no talking in the corridors, um, there's others that are <coughs> still good places to go. And, you know, say School 21 is a free school. It's doing really interesting, innovative stuff. Um, so I think, yes, be prepared to work, go, go to where there's great educational cultures, no matter what their structure is. Um, but I don't, I don't know if you've said all about my data. No, I no, need no, to no, add anything. Well, well, no, no, I, I just said that you can, whatever point you started comparing academies and maintained schools and the secondary and the primary level maintained schools, by the, if you take just results, academies yeah. come... Okay, just say where Yeah, just do a bit more. Yeah, I mean, just to say, Henry Stewart is famous throughout the educational community. It was just at the union meeting uh, for really single-handedly analysing the data about what academies are actually doing, because no one else is doing it, and it's been raised in Parliament. And across the press, they pick up his stories, don't they, and steal them from uh, various people we won't mention. Um, <laughs> but uh, to, to um, yeah... The, well, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to do it on camera, but um, yeah, um, yeah, basically, you know, really, really important research is going on, and that's why one of the reasons, you know, that the, the blog Local Source Network has become a pretty important blog to counter much of the right wing sort of blogging yeah. that is going on. And it's all okay. in here. And, and it's, it's all in here. here. Although there's more recent stuff on the blog. No, don't, yeah. don't say that. <laughs> Well, great stuff in there. 20% discount today, by the way, I forgot to say that. <laughs> great, great stuff in there. But just to, just to add to, what, to, to what's in there, um, I mean, yesterday, the, the Michael Wilshaw, I don't know if you are um, widespread readers of his wise words, but um, he, did, he, he pointed out that there's a real problem in secondary schools at the moment, in his terms, in terms of good results, but primary schools are doing really well. Now, can anybody here spot a key difference between primary schools and secondary schools. They're not large schools. Primary schools are not Yeah, uh, primary schools only 14% are academies. Secondary sector, which is supposedly been rescued by academies, is, is, is primarily academies and is a sector that's doing badly. Now, any of you as statisticians will know that causation, correlation isn't the same as causation, but let's look at, at the actual stats. I mean, the education bill that's going through, I'm sure Melissa's talked about it, will force any inadequate school to become and the cabinet. And Nicky Morgan has said no school, no child should remain in a, an inadequate school day longer than necessary. So clearly there must be a big problem out there that maintained schools are staying inadequate for years. Clearly there wouldn't be an education bill if that wasn't the case. So I went to look at this piece of data. Um, there are 323 primaries that were inadequate at their previous inspection and stayed in the maintained sector. Any guesses how many of those 323 schools remain inadequate at their next inspection. Given that we know it's a huge problem, all these schools staying inadequate, how many of those 323 would you guess stayed inadequate? They're not really my block. Yeah. <laughs> um, any, come on. 20. 20. Any other guesses? None. Well, there's not actually quite on these two. Really? That's amazing. Two schools. Uh, that's how big the problem is. Out of 323 uh, primaries, 0.6% too, as opposed to those that win sponsored academies where 8%, 12 times as many, you made in adequate. Um, and that is the major reason why I have a problem in the secondary schools. All the data I've analysed, and the latest data was for primary schools because that data came out uh, last month. And I grew the, what the uh, what Nikki Morgan does is she says things like sponsored academies have grown more than schools overall have grown. And that's true, but it's a completely false comparison. It's like if I ran a hospital and said, uh, among my sick patients, they've got better to faster rate than people in society as a whole. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, of course they have, because those weren't sick to start with. Um, and that's what the comparison, so what I do is I split it into fifths, equal, equal quintiles, uh, and look at how sponsor academies do compared to similar maintained schools. And in each of the categories where I look, on the primary schools, looking at level 4, level 4B, level 5, looking at 2013 to 15, looking at 2014 to 15, in all that produces 30 comparisons. You know, five in each of those. And of those, in 28 of them, the maintained schools did better, and normally significantly better. The average uh, amount better was a 5% greater growth, which is significant at a 99.5% level. Um, 
which means that the data is absolutely clear that there's something about sponsored academies that makes them less successful at improving uh, uh, challenges in schools. And the same on, on, on secondary schools. And none of this data, I've been doing it now for three years, is it? Three, four years. Ago. So none of this data, none of this analysis has ever been challenged by the DFV or by supporters. And I know they read it. I get comments from some of their supporters. None, none, they, none of that data has ever been challenged. And what you still get is the Secretary of State is making this comparison with all schools, which she knows, and all government that knows, is a false comparison. They can only get their stuff through by making this, these false statements. So the data is absolutely clear. The data is in there in the book if you want to uh, follow it. And it will continue to be on the blog. The secondary results will be out in two weeks. And again, I'll do the comparison. And I predict now that there will be significantly bigger increases in the maintained schools. As a result of the education bill, 49,000 extra students will remain in inadequate schools that wouldn't have otherwise. That's the actual consequence of forcing sponsored accounts. Well, that takes us neatly on to what's in Nicky Morgan's mind. Now, John, I don't know if you want to say anything, you're up there at the back, because you have a bit of an insight into what's going on in the well, world of legislation. <laughs> you don't. Could you tell us what you think is going to come down the tracks? You should say John Sorry. is an expert yeah. in parliamentary yeah. Yeah. In in law. law. Um, I'm, I'm just grateful to listen to you guys. Okay. Well, we, think we can take what we think we heard George Osborne say in the Autumn State Board, which, which is the government wants every school to become an academy. How they will actually go through that process remains to be seen. Um, whether it be one of coercion or incentive, probably more likely, whether they'll find enough sponsors. But what, and you know, we know that it takes quite a long time to convert schools to academy status, so they're really tying themselves up in a lot of knots over the next three years if that's what they want to do. There will be opposition, the process will be difficult, they'll have to lean on people to sponsor schools. And given everything that Henry said, it, it seems absolutely bizarre, given all the other problems the schools are facing, that that should be their one priority. But that appears to be the priority. My reading of it, I think, is probably that this comes from number 10, not from Nicky Morgan herself. Yeah. Um, and it's being driven again by the same ideological the because, people that you mentioned. Yeah, because Rachel Wolf, who's at the New Schools Network, is now at number 10 advising David Cameron. So I suspect the heart of policy making has gone there. The only thing, other thing I would say about Nikki Morgan, the only thing she, that has struck me about her is the decision she made to agree to the expansion of the grammar school in Kent. And I think that was quite significant, but I think it was more to do with backbench political manoeuvring. It was a silly decision, I think. Um, do you know about it? it? Yeah, yeah. And that she said this school that's 10 miles away is an annex, because you know it's illegal to have more selective schools, but she has agreed to expansion of the school that's 10 miles away. And um, it's, a, it's a nonsense, and it will be a new school, and everybody knows it. But for some reason, she decided to back it, and I'm not quite sure why she did because it will lead to floods of other grammars expanding. And it goes completely contrary, whatever you think of the conservative view of comprehensive education, it goes completely contrary to their so-called commitment to not expand grammars. They are allowing. So I, I suspect she's a bit behind the curve on, you know, I just can't really make Nicky Morgan out in terms, you know, at least Michael Bird had a very clear ideological purpose and was a good communicator. She seems more, to use a teenager, but more random and pragmatic. Yeah, I think that's probably the intention of having her there. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she just wants to be not to be Michael Bell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't think she's so going we don't to know what she's understand. Understand. We don't know what she stands yeah, for. I she's wasn't going doing to say that. I, I thought <laughs> being at the Ofsted Wilshaw talk last night was very interesting in the City of London, and there was the kind of elite of the educational establishment and it was mainly the you know CEOs of the Academy Trust really? you know suited men who are obviously I have to say very used to whining and dining and speaking with very loud important voices and these people are not to be messed with and I could imagine someone who's not confident would easily be swayed by um, and, and there's many of them and, and they don't uh, the atmosphere there was terrifying in the sense that there was just one vision, you know, um, we've got to solve the benighted, um, you know, work, white working classes with this sort of military approach, um, etc. So, yeah. Okay, more questions. One there. 
So they did with laptop and then I'll take John Fowler, yes, and then we'll come back to you. Um, so I'm a second year undergraduate educator. Can you just, yeah, yeah, and Rosie. Rosie. And, uh, and how do you think you can sort of tackle, push, how do you think you can recruit more people to even train for teachers? Because I'm completely apprehensive of even thinking of doing a PGC because I don't know if I want to be a teacher anymore. I don't know. And so how do you think you can kind of... Not because of this talk. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of this talk. Okay, it's just the general way to Should we take these three points together? We'll come yeah. back to them. Hi. Yeah. My name's uh, Marion Clancy, and I'm the um, coordinator for the uh, languages, PGC secondary here in Goldsmiths. And um, first of all, well done, Francis, for promoting unions. Um, I think um, that it's really, really important that. Um, teachers hold on to their union membership and if possible um, uh, be active. But I know that's not easy, so I think, I think um, as a PGC uh, tutor I go around a lot of schools and some, in some schools you feel very comfortable, you feel that teachers have got um, autonomy, uh, you feel that they can actually um, grow as teachers and professionals. And in other schools they're told how to teach, what to teach and it's very difficult and it's not very good. And you can see that from uh, the way pupils are almost sitting on their hands, uh, trying to behave um, in, these, in these very tedious lessons that I, I observe occasionally. But a lot of the schools we work with are not in that category. And that we work with academies. Um, we don't work with preschools yet, but we, we do it okay. again. So, um, but I think it is, a, it is a difficult thing for our young teachers going out because we are, we are promoting um, a type of teaching that allows, that encourages pupils to be creative, that encourages them to be critical thinkers and so on, and, and teachers to be critical thinkers. But they get to school, and I think there was a, a colleague, a PhD student from Art and Design saying, well, you can't teach like that. You've got to focus on skills, you've got to get them through the levels and, or whatever. And um, it, it's very sort of suffocating to go into that as a young teacher, full of optimism and hopefully a bit of idealism of improving the world through education. And I, I think, I mean, you're, you're, um, it's, thank you very much for all of your marvellous talk, but it's very dispiriting. And I think we've got a big job on our hands to, if you like, um, you know, get education back. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to do it. Um, but um, I think one of the great things is that teachers are teachers, so they go into preschools or academies and with their, you know, their, their, their educational philosophy, their strong personalities, they can make, have some impact, so I think that, that's quite good, but I think we shouldn't kid ourselves to think that these regional commissioners are somehow going to replace local authority, because what the local authorities did was, was uh, it's amazing when you think of it, because they did try to make a uh, um, education more equitable. You know, you had um, you had local authority um, educational psychologists. You had educational social workers. You had, you had a huge swathe of people supporting schools, and that's not happening in chains. And um, I don't know. I was going to ask you as well about the there's the sponsored academies that are the chains, and then the other academies are just directly under the government. Is that the right? Mm -hmm. And they're all going to be encouraged to join trust and all to join yeah, to join trust. Yeah, join sometimes, yeah. I think it's very, very dangerous that these, these, um, these corporate um, businesses are taking hold of our, 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 um, our education system. Stick, well, it's not about even buying it, they're giving it to them. Yeah. You've got, you know, Harris Academy has got all the schools around where I live, and it was local taxpayers that paid for those schools and those buildings. <coughs> In the evenings, they're letting out the sports facilities, you know, for their own profit and so on. And I'm sure it's not being plowed back into the into the into the school. But you've got you've got extra echelons of management that come in and, and train them. I mean, I think it's I mean, maybe I'm just a little bit glum, but I think we we really have to be a bit a little bit a bit of self righteous indignation about what our schools being stolen from. And I'm, no, no, Veronica's in a free school and she's doing marvellous work there, and that's very heartening. But the free schools get so much more money than the maintained schools, you know, and that, that's not fair, you know, it's not, um, I, I think it's a great, a big, a great, must be a great dilemma for our young teachers, where are they going to go? And, um, and how do you, 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 how do you
how are they going to look and deal with it? Um, John, anyway. just take my point for John, I'll come back. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to be responsible for putting everybody off teaching because I still think for any starting teacher now, it's going to be a wonderful career. But, um, I mean, following on from what you Fiona said, and, and um, I don't think we've seen anything yet in terms of the continual um, change that this government wants to introduce into education. Now, one thing I think is important to understand the difference between what they, some people refer to as 100% cannibalization, and on the other is the removal of local authorities from running schools. And actually, most of the statements by ministers about the move of local authorities and running schools, not 100% academisation. My hunch, probably that means is they're thinking of some other form of managing those schools that are currently maintained by local authorities. So um, it's a bit of watch this space, but um, I think it's probably a fairly well-known secret. There is the government planning a rather large white paper, school's white paper, that is going to come out in, well, as you speak to somebody I spoke to today, they reckon it will be out in March. My guess it won't be out until May, uh, with a, a bill the size of which will make the current education adoption bill look very small. The, the only good thing is that I, one who's been in this business probably a long time, this is fairly obvious, um, I remember the last Conservative um, Education Secretary who um, Announced he had a white paper that was going to be the end of all structural changes and solve everything. Somebody called uh, John Patton. But I mean, <laughs> yes, you might ask who he is, but I mean, he only lasts a year or so after making that uh, statement. So uh, I hope when uh, Mrs. Morgan does offer her white paper as the end to all solutions and the, the answer for 20, 30 years of um, stability in the system then remember what happened last time uh, you said the Secretary of State said that. Okay, thank you very much. I, I don't want to lose sight of Rosie's point. I mean, Francis, do you want to answer the point about, you know, people are losing confidence in the idea of going into teaching? And what, what are yeah, the reasons I mean, I, I would say, uh, obviously, uh, Alison could add to this. I, it, it's an amazing job. And, you know, I do think with the support of the union and with supportive colleagues and the you know, absolutely go into a free school that you feel comfortable with or an academy, an LA school, um, you know, and in some ways, I, maybe someone will shoot me for saying this, actually some of the changes to the exam system are a lot more beneficial than what we've had before. So, you know, I've been talking to my PTCE students about this, you know, for example, the changes to the GCSE English, although we do have a very high stakes exam system there, um, they are much better than the old control conditions thing that was in place, which was um, really not good for a reasons I won't go into but bit controversial, you know, bit well, controversial. Yes. <laughs> I do think I do think that they are trying to encourage I do think they are trying to encourage more independence of thought amongst learners um, Laurie Smith at King's has sort of said this is quite a few people you know who've so there are actually being in front of your students I think you you do have a kind of freedom there but yeah, yeah Alison. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think that there are kind of two challenges that we're facing at the moment. And it's in terms of the allocation mechanism. Alison's the head of PGC. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge that we've got is that every year we see the numbers that are allocated for yeah. universities to train teachers be reduced, be reduced, be reduced, be reduced. Now, well done to anybody who's on the PGC at Goldman because it is very tricky to get onto in terms of the numbers that actually apply that want to kind of do this pathway. And actually, to kind of answer what you were saying before about, you know, how do I know whether the school's right? If you follow a university-based model of, or even a school rep-based model within the university, you are going to have an opportunity to experience different kinds of settings and be exposed to slightly different kind of ideas. The challenge with some of the teacher education that's happening, not across all academy chains, but within some academy chains, is it's replicating. And actually, a lot of the students that fall within the, the, some of the big academy chain teacher education programmes don't know there's a different world out there. And that's the concern. And, and certainly the, the current way we're moving is that more numbers are being allocated to those academy chains, whereas we're being reduced, being reduced, being reduced. So it, 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 it's kind of being pushed that way. The other challenge that we've got, of course, is we've got a curriculum coming out for initial teacher education in the next year or so with the expert group that's now sitting and discussing what we have to actually teach, 
And if you actually look at the constituents of that executive group, it's quite interesting to reflect on where they sit within the education community. There's a lot of representatives from multi-academy trusts, sponsored academies, the Rubmissians, etc. So, you know, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's the way that we're going to be forced down. Um, and then where's that alternative going to come? Because that is important. Okay, any other points on that? I was just on the point on chains that was brought up. I mean, chains are, I think, the real problem. Um, it's only in terms of performance. If you look at the performance of individual academies, still on their own, still got the same teachers and heads that they had before when they were local authority, they often do fine. And the, the stats are okay on those. The problem is chains. If you look at the, uh, those DFE paper earlier this year, which looked at the top 20 chains, and only three of them had performance above value, of value added above the average. And it's certainly, I would be cautious, of, very cautious of change. If you want any autonomy of paper to teach how you want, certainly don't go somewhere like Ellis, for instance. Um, and it, it's the chains that have all the, you know, the highly paid chief executives, the ways of getting money out of schools, they are the real, uh, real difficulty that we've got. I think the government's now, you're talking about the large chains, aren't you? I mean, I think the government has recognised that, so the current direction is to try and persuade them to form small multi yeah, trusts, true. so you yeah. maybe get one secondary school to form a trust with a couple of primary schools and another secondary in your location, because that's the model that seems to have worked better. So I think the big chains are moving a bit out of fashion, aren't they? But of course, they've already got a lot of schools. That's they've the got lot of schools. Yeah. Can I just make There's a point? Yeah. 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 No, I was just going to make, which may relate to what you're about to say, which is just where is the political opposition to this? I mean, your point about feeling glum, you started out said you feel dispirited by my talk and then talk yourself back into dispirit from your own experience, so it made you feel better. But, you know, the obvious thing, listening to all of this, is where is a group of people arguing for a different view of the kind that we have... Well, I suppose what I really mean is where is the Labour Party, and let's not get into the Labour Party. We've got to get into the Labour Party and never get out, especially now in the current condition. But really, Labour has failed terribly, I think, to come up with a broad alternative and to challenge the corporate power and so on. Should yeah. we take these two? Yes. They two. Do you want to say yeah. something on this gentleman? Yeah. Do you want to say something? Because I think you were first. Ah, okay. Um, I'm Marie Stewart, and I'm very devoted to interest. I'm qualified as a teacher and also a psychologist, and I work in diversity and inclusion. And I just want to put a plea in for support for people doing. Um, PTSD because I'm concerned about the way teacher training is going, which is losing sight of the children. I mean, I wrote something back in, I think it was 1987, when the first lot of, of um, national curriculum stuff came out. And one of the comments I wrote then was, whoever produced those documents had an idea about the standard child, and there were going to be problems. And there's a straight line from that to all the exclusions. But the current teacher training, I watched a television program about Teach First with a lot of Teach First teachers. Now, my experience of teachers, and particularly trainee teachers, is that when they get together, they talk about the children. The Teach First people were talking about themselves, how difficult they were finding particular situations. And then we go even further. There's one called Teach Direct, I think it is. And when I asked, what's the difference? What's this program about? The explanation that I got was all about people in advance in their careers who are going to want to come into teaching, and, they, and it was all about catering to the needs of this population of people to come into teaching. And I had to say, well, has anybody thought about the impact on the children? And so we have this real problem that the idea, and, and they, the blog, are of course all those people like psychologists, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like people that have done three years teach training qualifications, who have a lot of knowledge about child development and child psychology mm -hmm. and think that the teaching should be built around the child, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so please support the point. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably it's a, an yes, sorry, yes, you, sorry, oh. you've had your hand up for ages, I'm going to take oh, it first. Um, I'm Andy Smart, I work in literacy, and I want to thank you for the work you're doing uh, this evening and uh, uh, all the time. My, uh, my point, I want to go back to the point you made about uh, uh, admissions being a critical uh, point in, in, in the process, and ask, 
couple of ask you to comment on a couple of things related to admissions. First of all, the, the evidence of the the stats on the on the academies and their their value added or not, and how that might relate to what sort of admissions procedures they are following if they are being restrictive in admissions. How is that affecting the statistics and what your how you compare the achievements of those academies with the, the other schools. Um, but also on admissions is what, what authority, the local authority has, I mean, and what, what its responsibility is in terms of uh, catering for all children and how that might in, uh, impact on the policies of schools and their admissions procedures. And have you had any examples where there have been clashes which haven't been res which have been resolved through points of law, or how does it work? Okay. We'll come back to admissions. Do you want yeah. to make your point? Mine might be a good one to end on. It's, um, so I said, I, my name's Alan, I'm with an SLB, uh, Special Leader in Education. So whether we like Gove or not, I think uh, he's changed the educational landscape in some way. If you had yourself a similar opportunity to be Secretary of State, how would you change the educational landscape? Okay. Um, any, I, I think I'm going to come back on the admissions part. Do you want to? Well, I, I think if you might have more of an answer on the value added yeah. side of the academies, do you? Uh, well, there, there's so many different uh, means of admissions. Um, like in Hackney, we have lots of academies. The local authorities still control the admissions for all schools. Um, although then you get um, uh, appeals where they can <coughs> do things on. But they are, uh, they are, I believe, authorities where academies are the academies do their own admissions. Well, they all do their, the, the local authority coordinates admissions, but the individual criteria and how the own admission schools choose their pupils is still done by the schools. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be done. The criteria, yeah, 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 absolutely. And we do have one one of the writers on, on, on our blog who believes that some very clever academies are spotting the children who yeah. have high CAT scores yeah. but low SAT yeah. scores. Now, I'll just explain what that means. <laughs> SAT scores is what you get at the end of year six. Every child goes to. CAT score is a measure. It's a measure. It's a bit like IQ. Is it? Yeah. Cognitive yeah. abilities yeah. test. Yeah. Testing. It's, it's, and. He thinks that schools like Mossbourne spot the kids who have got strong cats, but for some reason haven't done well in their sats, and therefore have a huge potential for value added. Um, yeah, and actually, I know that this blogger because I've published his book, uh, right. Roger, <laughs> Roger Tickham, Tickham yeah. and, and he, did, he, sh he shows a really interesting thing about Mossbourne that was originally the old Hackney Downs school uh, had supposedly been a failing school, but Roger really scrupulously goes through the kind of uh, IQ. Um, results for the two different schools, Hackney Downs and Mossbourne, and shows actually Hackney Downs wasn't doing badly at all. It was just admitting students who were who had very low IQ scores and uh, was doing just as well as Mossbourne did with those students. Really? Um, so it's quite an interesting thing, you know, that kind of myth that somehow Mossbourne turned things around. It was about admissions, actually. Yeah. But the other problem is we do not have any value-added measures. We used to have contextual value-added which were abolished by the Tories. We have something they call value added, but if you actually plot, uh, take, plot <coughs> value added against uh, level at entry, the value added of the m more able students is much bigger on average than those who are less able. So schools with a lot of more able find it much easier to have a high value added than schools with a lot of less able. So at the moment, there's no measure that accurately measures value added. Um, so actually, all the value added measures are biased towards the the, the more able. And so one thing for instance Mossbornism, because I know it's one of my local schools, is it's actually set it has banding it set its entry criteria to be at the national average, yeah, yeah. not the Hackney average. Yeah. So it has a result as the highest entry. So Hackney aren't doing their admissions, they're doing their own admissions. Well, yeah. Yes, you're right, you're right actually. Yeah. So so Hackney does an admissions <laughs> based around that criteria. Yeah. Yes. So they are all sorts of fiddles going on. And it's actually yeah. so complex that you need to do as Henry has done or Roger Tipton has done, you need to really go into yeah. how a school is using its criteria and its admission policies to do whatever it is you're saying you're doing. Now, yeah. what parent can do that? What happens? It's back to the, <coughs> the sort of over the point I made in the talk is that parents will often say, I want them to go to a good school. And often the good school is a school that is, to use short and manipulating its admissions to its advantage. But so subtly, 
then it would take experts to to know that. And uh, there were two other aspects of that I was going to mention. Faith schools, which has always been a bit of a bugbear for those of us in London, where parents would often say, I want to go to a good school. And that would often be the faith school that was using all sorts of... And um, I looked up the criteria for admissions to one faith school, which I think has been found to be the sixth most socially selective state school in the country. Pages and pages of admissions documents you have to live close to here, you have to have cleaned the altar 24 times, changed the vicars, you know, made the vicar a hot chocolate and all this kind of thing. And it's just, and then it gets what, it creates a student body that then allows the virtuous circle to work. And then all the children who don't get in then go to the school that they say is a sink school. And the final thing which came up at a conference we had recently, I'm chair of Conference of Future and Fiona's vice chair, we sort of, di slightly different part of our campaigning, uh, Becky Allen from Education Data Lab talked about a huge problem of mid-year admissions where schools are refusing to take people who've been excluded and um, you know there's lots of young people who leave because of a problem in year eight so who is going to take them and lots of schools just won't play ball so then those difficult children go to one school and not another. So it's, what it needs, and this is back to the political problem, it needs somebody, and I think it should be Labour, to set up, they've got four years until the next election, to set up an inquiry of real experts to look at what all the problems are and what practical solutions there are to creating fairer admissions. But I think you're, you asked about the local authority. At the exactly. end of the day, any little oversight that existed locally in the form of the admissions forum has sort of disappeared, and because these schools are accountable to the Secretary of State, the whole process yeah. for complaining about unfair admissions, and you can't get any change unless you make a complaint, so if nobody complains, unfair practices can just continue, involves being referred back to the Secretary of State, so it's become a very complicated area, so the solution I think must be to bring back local accountability for admissions, and I would like to see the admissions form have the responsibility for looking at the intakes of every school, looking at, looking at how they compare, I feel a column coming on, how does the, the, the number of free school meals in the school compare to the number of free school meals in the local community? And if a school does not represent its local community, it shouldn't be allowed to become outstanding in Ofsted, in my view. So you've got to put the incentives in place for schools to want to take in some of these pupils that, at the moment, they're rejecting. But they're, at the moment, there's no local accountability, really, in that process at all. There's no way the regional school commission is going to do yeah. that, talk to you about. Does the local authority have no uh, legal authority in that sense? I mean, well, John, John, could you just correct me on this? I mean, I think you, you could, the, the, it's the Office of the Schools Commissioner who regulates the system, but they can only respond to complaints. And they have to see the schools are abiding by the admissions code but then if nobody complains, they don't. They can get away with not abiding by the code. What's the local it's authority? The school the adjudicator. The school adjudicator. Sorry, yes. But what does yes. the local authority power? What power? Well, the local authority can uh, make a complaint. They can make a complaint to the adjudicator, just like anybody else in this room yeah. can make a complaint. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long process. Yeah. So it's, it's it, you know there's not there isn't very much of work local. I mean, the only duty the local authority specifically has, which might be they take an overview, is they're supposed to put all the admission arrangements on the local authority's website. Yeah. So one hopes that somebody might actually from the local authority be looking at the total picture, but yeah. who knows. I mean, if you've got a lot of academies in your yeah. area, it's probably quite unlikely. But it is, it is very difficult because local authorities have two local responsibilities. Local, as named to the press release last week, but local authorities are responsible for ensuring enough school places in the area. But they can't create new schools and they can't ask academies to increase their roles. So they're, you know. Cows. They can't control the admissions <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the same time, some local authorities are trying to find ways, like, you know, I, I know in Hackney, they, the, the uh, Learning Trust, who's the Education Authority, um, has no power over academies, but will say things like to academies, like if you if you carry on like this, we will make statements about it. We will make statements saying that uh, parents should be cautious about sending their children to your school. So there's some things active local authorities can still do, but legally, there isn't much. Okay. Should we wrap this up? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, now, yeah. you've asked a question. question about what would the one thing we'd all do to, to a positive progressive policy going forward. So Francis, stop you. I'm going to be really controversial. I'm going to say you get rid of all uh, external exams and you move to a teacher assessment system and <laughs> get rid of Ofsted um, and, and you actually empower teachers to choose what's best for their own, uh, for their own students 
uh, the types of assessment they should do and that the accountability agenda comes in with parents like was being advised before with Davina, parents and teachers going into their local school and seeing what it's like for themselves and making their own judgments based on what they see. Okay, Melissa? Can I say two things? It's like desert island discs, you know, can you take... Yeah. I would want to go back to basics about reforming teacher education because I think, I think it's a disaster what's happened in the last five years and I'm very interested in other countries in here. We look at, our, you know, every other successful country has a much longer period of initial teacher education to a much higher level and then gives more autonomy to teachers and I think we've got it completely the wrong way around. And so I would do that. And secondly, I don't know whether I totally go along with Francis, but I think the baccalaureate idea, which would involve in the end the phasing out of GCSEs that's come from the Heads Round Table, where it's a more flexible system and it's more individual and it's actually got more challenge in it, but it allows students with different emerging capabilities to learn together up until 16. Um, and, you know, more individual project work and that kind of thing. And I think that's a pragmatic idea that an alternative political party could promote. Okay, I think I would, instead of looking at PISA for what it, the international comparisons like the PISA study, for what it tells us about what we do badly, I would look at it for what it tells us about the successful countries do well, and three fact features keep recurring. The first is strong lo local oversight. The second one is a focus on comprehensive, balanced intakes in all schools. And the third one is a relentless focus on the quality of teaching. Because if you go through all the evidence, at the end of the day, it comes the success of your children comes back to the quality of the teaching they receive in the classroom. And of course, there is variability within schools even between the quality of the teaching. But if we put all our emphasis on the quality of teaching, that would be the big political idea, I think, if I was you know, Labour Secretary of State. You've got to get the best people into teaching. You've got to give them continuous professional development and education. You've got to boost their morale. And that is the way that you'll raise standards if we've got to keep the standards of gender centre of everything. And I think ultimately parents do want their children to achieve, but in a rounded way, so the baccalaureate would be a good thing to